so I guess with that, everyone, we're going to go ahead and uh, get this started. Um, so I want to introduce myself. My name is Jacob Snuffer. I'm the president of Pi Sigma Alpha, um, which is the pre-law or the political science honor fraternity on campus. And we are uh, the organization that is hosting this event, uh, Higher Education and the Arts. And we're really, really glad to have our guest speakers here today, Larry Gross and Tim Mainland. Um, so let's just give them a uh, round of applause. So first I want to go over some house rules. Um, so we're going to end promptly on time, but our guest speakers are going to stick around uh, if you have any more questions that you want to ask them directly. Um, so there will be some times for questions before 8, but the way we're going to be asking them isn't, uh, we're not going to give around the microphone. But instead, uh, you will have an index card, and you'll write your questions on that index card, and we will have some people from Pi Sigma Alpha that is gonna be in the aisles and uh, looking for people with index cards that have a question on them. And so if you see one of them, just give them your question, and then we will try to get to that if time allows. Um, so, Lastly, I want to ask each of you to silence and put away your cell phones just so we can pay um, our guests as much respect as possible. So with that, I want to introduce our panelists. So the first one we have is Tim Mainlin. Uh, Tim is primarily a composer, but he has always enjoyed playing string instruments. His first instrument was the piano at age seven, but it was at age 11 that the strings of the ukulele captured his heart. He hasn't stopped playing stringed instruments since, focusing on bass in junior high, orchestra, uh, high school band, college orchestra, and guitar in other ensembles. He was educated at the University of California at Santa Barbara, uh, Université de Bordeaux, and the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music. He studied composition with Peter Fricker, Lucas Foss, Scott Huston, and Paul Palombo. Although his studies focused on composition and upright bass, he always found the time to continue work with guitar, banjo, and various other stringed instruments. He became a professor of music here at Concord University in 1978, where he has been a prolific composer and teaches music theory, composition, classical guitar, and classic banjo. So let's give him a hand clap. And second, we have Larry Gross. And now I'm just going to mention a few of uh, Larry Gross's many accomplishments in the field of music. So his first album was recorded in 1969, Peace and Joy and Power. After graduating in 1970, he moved to New York where he was a performer at Focus, which was an Upper West Side organic food restaurant. Uh, he has signed a recording contract before with Daybreak Records, which is a subsidiary of RCA Records. His first album of original songs, The Wheat Lies Low, was released in 1970. He's had appearances on The Tonight Show, The Merv Griffin Show, American Bandstand, The Midnight Special, The Disney Channel, and many others. In 1983, Gross co-founded Mountain Stage, a two-hour live music program produced by West Virginia Public Radio and distributed nationally and internationally by NPR and Voice of America's satellite radio service. He has served as host and artistic director for every broadcast to date, and his musical tastes have been instrumental in defining the sound of the show. So let's give him a hand clap as well. And the last thing that I'll say about them, and then um, I'll be quiet for a little while and we'll start asking them some questions, is that they have found a career and they are truly diamonds in something that they are passionate about. And that's something that I think that we can all strive for and that we can all respect. And so I really look forward to hearing from you guys and um, hearing about what you all do and the arts in higher education. So thank you so much. All right. So um, I'm going to start out by asking you a question. What is the most fulfilling experience that you have had in your musical career? And that's for both of you. It's a tough one, isn't it? 
uh, you know, the trouble with it questions when they they want to list things. What's the best, the biggest, the most, whatever? It's very difficult because if you've been around as long as I have, you've done a lot of different things, and the music that I've done, uh, probably the most fulfilling thing has been the production of music on Mountain Stage, because we've now done 954 shows, presented probably 3,000 different artists, all musicians, and I think that's probably, it's not something that I composed, but it's something that I was the artistic director of, so that would have to be mine, I guess. If you ask me that same question, uh, Ten minutes from now, I'll probably give you a different answer for the same reason that Larry difficult. gave. Yeah, you know? but the first thing that comes to mind um, is the number of students I have taught that have end up ended up in professional careers in music. Um, I have uh, one who is curator at a museum collection of musical instruments. I have uh, three that are college professors. I have. Uh, I don't know how many that are school teachers. I have a couple that are school principals, and um, they and they write me back, and I find that very fulfilling. It's not maybe what you wanted as an answer, because it's not specifically musical. It's more about uh, music education. But ask me in ten minutes, we'll get a different answer. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to go to another question. It is a common misconception that art-related degrees yield little return on investment. What can you say to skeptics on this matter? You're, you're the professor. Yeah, I can talk about that for an hour, so this will be over by then. Uh, we get that all the time. And uh, in our dinner conversation, I, I recalled uh, getting to hear a famous man that was sort of an esoteric fame. Uh, Vladimir Uzachevsky, a Russian immigrant uh, to the U.S. in the 1930s who became a pioneer in electronic music. And he was uh, responding at, at a, in Cincinnati at a college music society meeting to that same issue. Uh, and he had statistics and he pointed out that music in this country is a multi-billion dollar industry. If you think about it, it's everywhere you go. It's in the supermarket, it's in the elevator, it's in your school, it's on the radio, you go down the street listening to it. Uh, there is music being produced all the time by hundreds of thousands of professionals. And uh, yet we constantly hear this conventional wisdom. Music, you're gonna major in music there, there's nothing, there's nothing you can do there. And, uh, I think about uh, Dr. Uzichewski and what he said, that uh, it, it's an odd assertion that this is not a useful area of study. This brings up the whole question of education versus training. And you can, you can have a school, I'm talking about schools now, because you can educate yourself without a school, but if you're in a school, a school can focus on training, can focus on education. In my opinion, education is much wider and it's, it's, it has to do with liberal arts uh, and not just one field. You, you need to be trained in many things. You gotta be a doctor, you gotta be trained, engineer, you gotta be trained. For example, a musician has to be trained. You gotta learn technique. What I, can, what I call the letter. Two sides of life, the letter and the spirit. The letter you, is, you can train, but you, you know you can train monkeys too. You can train robots, and so the question is, why should you learn history and literature and music and art and all the things that that are associated with liberal arts? Because it makes you educated, and because it, it gives you a wide perspective, it gives you context, a historical perspective, and it lets you be a person who decides how you, you're more likely to be the boss than to be somebody working on a line if, you're, if you have a bigger picture in your mind. So that's what I think. I think that most of the people that I know who have risen to leadership roles, the ones I admire, not all the ones I know, but the ones I admire, uh, are people who have a, a wider perspective and they get that from the kind of education where you take you learn about your history. You learn about uh, your arts. 
I mean, here, I'm going to read you a quote from Ruskin, and I'm sure you've studied some of you, John Ruskin, the famous art historian from the 19th century. He said, great nations write their autobiographies in three manuscripts, the book of their deeds, the book of their words, and the book of their art. Not one of these books can be understood unless we read the two others, but of the three, the only trustworthy one is the last. And I agree with that. That's, that's where you're going to find out what, what a people really is, what a... What a group of people is looking at their arts and so that's since that's the subject tonight I want to make sure I read that before the night was over whether that's cogent to this question I don't know but I like that quote absolutely um, so I forgot to ask you all if you had any opening statements or things that you wanted to tell the students uh, before we move any further with any questions or anything like that so is there anything that you would like to say to all the students now you got something that, yeah go ahead <laughs> Actually, to tell you the truth, uh, Jim White talked to me about planning this seminar a year ago, and it got snowed out. And he said, well, we'll do it next year. And uh, I didn't remember it until yesterday. So I had some, I jotted some things down just in case. Um, I read uh, a short while ago, um, a book I found in the Concord Library called Music, Ecstasy, and the Brain. It's written by Robert Jourdain, and it's a very conversational reporting kind of book about new studies in neurology and music. That is, how the brain actually processes sound. And uh, I hadn't really thought of it quite the way that this new scientific approach had it. And the, the way the, the brain processes the patterns of sound uh, gave me some, some new insights on it. And I think if I were to have an opening statement, I'd start there and talk about how we perceive things and how we perceive sound, uh, how we hear pitch uh, as, a, as a simple thing. And, Rhythm and tempo is a simple thing, and loudness is a simple thing. But then you recombine those into a language full of ironies and contradictions, and you can create a, a work of art that feels very much like it means something specific, but is actually just about your emotions. Uh, now we see uh, art music, theater, and phys ed, other than football, being cut all over the country to save money. And I think it is a huge mistake to do that because we are leaving out this profound level of communication that is beneath our language. Uh, when I teach music history, my favorite one to teach is the early music history, we can get under the skin of people whose languages and whose thoughts and whose values we don't know by hearing their music and we can get an idea about their spirit. And uh, I think it's extremely important. Yeah, I made a couple notes. I, I already read the quote that I wanted to from Ruskin, but I wanted to talk about it. And I wanted to talk about the difference between training and education, I already mentioned that, and the letter and the spirit. I'm not even going to go into to trying to define what art is, you know, why is art important in higher education. Um, you can use your own definition of art, uh, but I'm including in that arts and, and probably humanities too, uh, all of it, because it's what shapes your worldview and it's what, the, one of the things the arts do the best and nothing else hardly does, is they help create empathy between people. All the arts do this, from visual art to music to dance, all of together, what happens as you witness or participate in this, you feel a connection to other people that you don't feel in any other way. And, and, the, and the, to be empathetic and to understand uh, why you're connected to other people is directly related to, I think, every world religion I've ever heard of has a teaching that goes like, treat other people the way you want to be treated. 
And it's harder to do that if you don't feel a connection with other people. And I think that uh, the arts are the best thing at doing this. Um, I think to a great extent, life is subjective. The way you see the world is uh, the way the world is. Definitely the way it is to you. And I think the more you can cultivate the way you see things uh, and understand things better, then that leads to less fear, it leads to less anger, it leads to all the things that cause problems, I think it leads to less of those. And another simple thing, why, would you, why should art be involved in higher education? Now, with Constitution Week, I know, this has to do with the, the uh, Declaration of Independence, though. What does it say there that it says in no other declaration in, in countries around the world was first here? Life, liberty, and what? The pursuit of happiness. What makes people happy? What makes you happy? I mean, maybe if you, if you really are into, um, you know, your job, you can certainly get satisfaction, deep satisfaction if you're building a bridge or certainly, you know, if you're curing somebody, there's a lot of things you do that you can get satisfaction. But delight and inspiration are hard to get. We look to religion for inspiration often. Religion is disappearing in our world. And to me, I've been inspired many, many, many times by arts, by performances, by things that I've seen. And I think that's super important because if you're not inspired and you don't have delight in your life, you turn in directions you don't want to turn. Uh, thank you. So now I want to go back to something uh, that Dr. Mainman said, and I want to ask you a follow-up question. So the U.S. and West Virginia state governments have not made our education a priority in terms of funding. In what ways can we change this moving forward? That's, I, that's a political question, isn't it? I mean, that's uh, how do you change government? Ask Jim back there, he probably knows better than I do. Um, one thing you do is, is let, let your uh, feelings, your beliefs, what you think is right be known. Many people, uh, it's easy to do this, just sit around and complain to each other without ever contacting anybody because sadly you think probably it's no use to contact my representative or whatever, they don't get it. My experience is in a lot of public things that that they do listen because they don't get all that much, especially spontaneous. You know, if someone's organizing a campaign, they get 10,000 emails that says the same thing. That's one thing. But if they hear from individuals who have a passion and a belief about something, certainly some won't listen, but I think that some will listen. And I, that's the only thing I can talk about is, is advocate, uh, be an advocate for what you believe and perhaps join organizations uh, to do the same thing because it is not, it's not easy to get things changed, obviously. When my father was a, a young man, uh, starting a family, he moved us to Santa Maria, California, which was just a little strawberry farming town. There was nothing there, because that's where he got the best job offer. And not long after we got there, my brother and I, that were, were quite young, um, Camp Cook, which was a correctional facility for the U.S. Air Force, was chosen to be the uh, site of the missile launches for the polar orbit. That is, all the weather satellites, all the spy satellites, and all the atomic weapons. It became Vandenberg Air Force Base. And they brought in literally hundreds of top-level, highly educated civilian scientists and technicians. And they flooded that little town of Santa Maria, which grew within five years from being a town of 20,000, about the size of Bluefield, to being one of the uh, larger, well, not, not compared to Los Angeles, but one of the larger towns in, in uh, Southern California. It grew to be a town of 50, 60,000, just like overnight. And one of the things that these technicians and scientists did was vote in school bonds and vote to support schools and uh, lobby for orchestras and schools, art programs, theater programs. Uh, 
This is what the educated top level scientists and technicians of that day wanted first. And I was lucky. I got a fabulous education, early education in, in the arts. And it was because of the intellectuals that flooded this little community that that happened. And all of you as college students, college graduates or future college graduates need to think about that as well. What do you want to flood your town with? What, what are you going to bring to the place that you go to work? Uh, if you can bring in this, this wider view of things. Someone that was a nuclear physicist wanted his children that were going to be in the local public schools to have music, to have art, to have history. And they worked for it, and they put their time and effort into it. And that's what the, uh, that's what educated people need to do. You need to make it happen. Um, so Larry, I've been told that you have homeschooled your daughter for uh, one of their years out of high school. Can you talk a little bit about why you decided to do that? Well, I have, I have two daughters, and my wife and I together, we kept them out one year. I'm not a homeschool guy, but I was afraid that the public education was not going to, and so was my wife. We were concerned that there were some things that they were going to miss. I, I, it's possible they wouldn't have, but I, my observation is that they probably would have missed uh, some of some of the things that we taught them. And uh, uh, it was we did one of them in the eighth grade, the other in the ninth grade. We're lucky because my wife and I both work in jobs that don't have to go to an office from nine to five. Otherwise, it would be very difficult to do this. But we both have flexible hours, so we could meet with them several times a week. And I taught literature and history via art history and. She taught mathematics and science because that's, that's what her specialty is. Because I, I thought it was uh, likely, although I may be wrong, because they, they, they learned some things in high school, but they didn't go quite as much as we, deep as we did. If you graduate from high school and, and you don't know uh, anything about the Greek and Roman world in your own civilized past, if you don't know anything about uh, the Gothic world, about the Renaissance, about the romantic movement, then I don't think that you're educated. So I wanted to teach my kids. I wanted them to recognize the, that and a lot more to at least know what I'm, they're, they're, they're you know, 13 years old, whatever they were. So there, there's only so much they can take in. But it was really important to me that they don't miss out on some of these things. And I'm not blaming teachers for this so much as the educational system in schools that, that are aimed at testing and aimed at other things that sometimes uh, lose sight of the, of the bigger picture. So that's why we did that, right or wrong, and I'm, I'm glad we did. Also, it was a wonderful way, if any of you are parents and you have the opportunity to do that, uh, it was a wonderful way to get to know your child in a different way. So that was a good good relationship. But that's why we did it, and I'm glad we did. I think it came they came out okay, and they went back into school, and uh, I think it was, it was a good thing to do. Um, so Dr. Mainland, as a parent and an educator, uh, can I ask you to respond um, as to the homeschooling? Uh, yeah, um, my wife Maggie and my daughter Tally and I homeschooled two of my granddaughters for a year one time, and we found it to be uh, an immense amount of work. Did you find that? It is. It's an immense amount of work, but um, we were able to uh, explore more individually. What, what they needed and what they wanted. And I think when they went back to school the following year, they, they were pretty much ahead of the game. Um, I'm really a fan of the Montessori concept where you find out what the kid is good at, what, where they're going, and you uh, go with that. And from, from any one thing, you can branch out to everything. Um, there's a, a little known book by uh, Elspeth Huxley called Love Among the Daughters. She is the granddaughter of Aldous, uh, the, 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 nep, the niece, all right, the niece of Aldous Huxley, the famous author. And she was studying agriculture, and she's British, and she was critiquing the American education system. She went to Yale. She said how odd it was that I needed one credit. And so I looked around for something that was one credit. Uh, didn't care what it was, I just had one credit. And she thought that was a pretty odd, and you've probably all had that experience, uh, an odd American sort of thing to do to get the numbers to come out right. 
But what she discovered was a class in the agriculture department called pomology, the study of apples. She said, wow, <laughs> this is my one credit. I have one hour of apples. What a stupid thing. But in her book, she reveals that that one class changed her life. Because if you really study apples, what does an apple do? Where, where does it come from? What do you do with it? It's, it's biochemistry. Uh, it's culinary arts. It's distribution and business. Uh, it is history. How, how has that uh, particular fruit been used by different peoples at different times? And she said, from one, one little thing, you can open up the whole world. Um, I might be off the topic here, but uh, with a small classroom, you can get to know what the particular student wants and move into the whole world. Now, our current thinking on education is to save money. That's what I hear all the time now. And the current pressures on us are to make classes larger. And the pressures on the music department here are excruciating. Why do you need these one-hour classes? Why can't you get more kids in this? Uh, it's about money. And making classes larger and making classes uh, with specific learning outcomes that everybody's going to match is going down the wrong road, in my opinion. We need to have uh, coaching, we need to have a tutorial, we need to get to know our students and know where it is they're going. Because from wherever that student is headed, you can access the whole world. I want to say one more thing I forgot to tell you because it amuses me, maybe it'll amuse you too. My, I thought my daughter Bonnie was the last one I homeschooled. She was 13 in eighth grade. And as I said, I taught her a wide range of literature and then I would give her tests. And we had studied some of Shakespeare, you know, not very small, but some stuff. And for the heck of it on the test, I asked her this question, what, see what, how you would answer. What is, uh, what is Shakespeare's worldview? And I was, this is worth all teaching. What she wrote was, a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. It's 13 year old kid. I thought, okay, buddy, you pass. All right, I, I thought it was really interesting um, that you talked about how you didn't like it when education was too funneled in and focused on just a few things and too specialized. So I have a question for you. Do you believe that college students should be required to take more than one arts course? We recently had a uh, rollback on that. They were required to take, you all were required to take two. We had a rollback to one. Um, that, of course, in, in, in terms of uh, income, in terms of student credit hours generated, we take you know, the number of students we have times the number of credit hours they take, and we get some sort of rating, which I think is a very False. That's like taking the number of left-handed Irishmen and multiplying it by the number of clouds in the sky, and you get a number that doesn't mean anything. Uh, I didn't necessarily oppose cutting it back. I would oppose. I, I would be uh, in favor of a broader set of choices that could include more fine arts courses or less. Um, going back to my. Uh, impression of the, the Montessori concept where you find out what it is that the student is good at, what they're interested in, and you use that portal to open up the whole world. I'm in favor of a more open-ended kind of uh, set of requirements uh, and not a cookie cutter, one size fits all uh, general studies program. Um, so we've gotten through a few more questions. Um, so I just wanted to ask if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask our panelists. Um, and if you are done with your index card, and if you'll just raise the index card up in the air, then we'll have someone um, collect that for you. So just be patient and keep holding your hand up, and we will get that uh, momentarily. Um, so, Mr. Gross, I wanted to ask you, what is your favorite mountain stage memory? Um, uh, 
that's impossible. That, as I said, we're, we're coming up like we're 950 shows plus. Uh, I'll give you one that was that was very touching. We had, uh, you, didn't, you know who Hugh Masekela is, anybody here? South African jazz musician. He happened to be, we booked him on Mountain Stage. He was on actually two or three times, but the last time he was on, he's passed away since then. Um, he was on Sunday, and unbeknownst to any of us, that same weekend, Mandela came back to South Africa. And Hugh Masekela had been exiled from South Africa until then. And Monday he was getting on the airplane to fly for the first time back home. It was a very emotional time for all of us. It was really, it was uh, beautiful and it was touching. And he obviously was full of joy when he played. He had a song called Mandela, Bring Back, uh, you know, Nelson Mandela is the name of the song. And it was, uh, it was a moment that nobody will forget on the show. That's one of many memorable moments. And now I want to ask uh, you, Dr. Bandlin, uh, what are you working on musically right now? Yeah, I'll answer that, but first I want to answer my, my favorite mountain stage moment. <laughs> there was an ad that went out that said mountain stage would be broadcast on Saturday at some time, and then the show would be live on Sunday. And I remember Larry saying on the air that somebody wrote in and said, well, they're going to listen to it on the radio first before they came to hear it live. <laughs> a little space-time continuum problem. I love that. Yeah. My other favorite mountain stage moment was when you had uh, Paul Stuckey from yeah. Peter, Paul, and Mary. More than anyone else, when I was 10, 11 years old, Peter, Paul, and Mary got me interested in music. I had a chance to go hear one of these people. And uh, so my daughter and I, she was, I think, eight or nine at the time, my daughter and I went up to hear him. And after the show, I stood around, talked to Larry for a while, and I noticed Paul Stuckey sitting on the stage packing up his stuff. So we walked up to him and said, hey, can we help you pack your stuff? He says, no, I'm good at this. And he sat and talked to me and my daughter for an hour. Yeah. It was fabulous. Yeah. What was your cool. question again? <laughs> Pretty <laughs> so great. So the question Pretty was, great. what are you working on right now musically? Um, I'm always working on compositions. Uh, that just seems to be the background noise in my life. I'm always writing compositions down. But um, the specific project I'm in right now is Maggie and I have gotten uh, hired by several Renaissance festivals. Uh, in, uh, there's one new one in West Virginia, and we met folks there, and they invited us to perform in the Pittsburgh Festival, which we've done now for a second year, and the Carolina Festival. And uh, we have uh, collected or built copies of historic instruments and uh, I am writing uh, period copy pieces that we can play on, on them that sound like the music of the 14th century and 15th century. So okay. I'm doing a lot of uh, uh, fake historical music right now <laughs> that, that, that we can play. All right, so uh, I'm going to ask you a question from the audience, and I'm assuming this is for both of you guys. Um, so what are some qualities or characteristics you think pursuing the arts gives you that you cannot get from choosing a, a STEM kind of career path? Uh, what kind of career path? Uh, something in the STEM, so oh, uh, mathematics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, think, I think we already covered this mostly of, of uh, And it's, it gives you a sense of your, of your culture and your civilization that is necessary for STEM, it's necessary for anything. And I think the more you study, and I, this, this goes across the broad spectrum of the arts and the humanities too, I mean history and literature and all of the different performing and non-performing arts uh, give you that kind of context that kind of, uh, uh, it's, it's what it is, is wisdom, I mean, that you don't get from anything else, and you can apply it to everything else. Um, 
I refer again to a book I mentioned earlier, Music Ecstasy in the Brain. For me, there's a certain kind of ecstasy associated with music. My earliest memory was my father playing the piano. And growing up, we had old 78s of Horowitz playing the Beethoven sonatas. And I would listen to those again and again and again. And I was just drawn to it. And uh, I think, like I mentioned, Peter, Paul, and Mary who got me interested in, in music. I listened to their records over and over and over. And uh, Beethoven blew me away. And Peter, Paul, and Mary sang me through my childhood. And the Beatles provided the soundtrack of my early adulthood. There's a certain uh, ecstasy that I, I just could not leave alone. And I explored a variety of majors in college my first year. Um, I took chemistry, I took biology, I took anthropology, and then I kind of wanted to play the piano, so I decided I had to take music theory. I didn't much want to, and I walked into the music theory class. After one lecture, the sky opened up and the angels sang, and I was carried off on a cloud of ecstasy. I loved it, and I still love it. And it, there's a uplifting, for me personally, character of hearing a good piece of music and even more in participating in a good piece of music. Uh, whatever style it might be, there's a, there's a power in it that, uh, that speaks to me. And I know I'm more involved in songs, not so much musical compositions, because that's what Mountain Stage does is songs. It's a, even the theme says that the world's turning around a simple song. And I, I really believe that. And the best songs, it doesn't make a difference what style they are, what genre they are, or what tempo or anything else are. They function, they can function, and I think they often do function like hymns. And ask yourself, and I've, I've made record, I've made five records of Christian hymns along with a whole bunch of other things because I like this music and I like these things. When people are sick, when people are hurting, when people are dying, you think they want to hear a hymn or you think they want to hear a sermon? That's what, that's what the arts do. I think that's a really good point. Um, so the next question, and I think Dr. Mangan, you've already answered a lot of this with your last um, answer, but it's another question from our audience and it says, how did you come to realize that you are passionate about the arts? Why did you decide to make a career out of it? And so any, either of you can answer that one first and just go from there. Uh, I guess I already did answer that, but it's kind of what floated my boat. It's, it's what I love that um, I uh, advised freshmen coming into Concord for about 35 years and I would always tell them this, find the thing, and the question is always, what can I do to make a lot of money? And my answer was always, I would, I would tell them this, do the thing you love to do. Because if you, if you really hate accounting, even though it's a really hot field, you're not going to do well in it. But if you, if you really love uh, sociology, even though it's not a hot field, and you do well in it, you're, you, because you, you, it'll be because you love it. So uh, I, I love I loved the music, and, and that's, uh, that's what took me away, and that's what I wanted to do. If you're gonna, I've only made my living either making music, writing songs, singing, or producing and presenting. Those are the things, I've, and I've been lucky. I didn't have to have a second job ever from the time I was in, I started playing music for money when I was in junior high school and when I graduated from college I started playing music for money and I never I never have done anything else and any musician will tell you I don't know about the really most famous ones I've met some of those but not many and they're not my friends um, but musicians that I know that do well I mean they, they do quite well I will tell you until if you're young without trying to be ugly or <laughs> say don't do this unless you have to do this. If you're not happy if you don't do it, then do it. If you have any other choices and you think you're gonna go into this because you're gonna become famous and you're gonna get wealthy, please do something else. 
because everybody has to go through a difficult time. However, it's true, financially you go through different times, but as I told somebody the other day, you know, I don't make a whole lot of money even what I do now, and, 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 and uh, I probably make more money than most musicians in this state, maybe, maybe all of them, I don't know. But the big point is, I have more fun than anybody does. And when I, whatever you do, I don't know what you do, I don't care what you do. You may have as much as fun as me, but you don't have more fun than me. I guarantee it. That's a benefit. You can't translate that directly into money, but you know what? I don't care. There's a, there's a Duke Ellington quote. And Duke Ellington was famous for being an, an honest and uh, easy man to work with. He had a band of 30 guys that he traveled with for 30 years. And he was asked how he kept them together. And it, it came out of the conversation that he actually paid his members of the band more than he paid himself, even though he was the empresario and the band leader and the, uh, you know, a, a well-known organizer. He would get jobs for other people. And they asked Duke Ellington, and they asked him, why do you uh, pay your band members so much when you could be a lot more wealthy? And he says, well, they may get the money, but I get the kicks. Hmm. Uh, so the next question, there's a lot of people in the audience uh, that are future educators. And what they want to know is, what can they do to bring more fine arts into their classrooms? And what, what level? Any level? Elementary? And every level you're talking about, I, yeah, whoever asked, asked the question, um, it's too bad that uh, we don't have more specialists, uh, music specialists and art specialists particularly, but I know that a lot of teachers have the, the talent to, to, especially music, a lot of people are into music, whether it's playing it or knowing something about it so they can play examples of it. And I think that, especially younger kids, uh, it's, it's magical. I mean, you can use music in, in so many ways to talk about other things. It's like the apple. You can teach a lot of lessons with music uh, because of subject matter and because of history and, and everything else. And I, don't, I just don't know what restrictions people are under in schools and you know, what they're allowed to do and what they're not. But I certainly would... Uh, suggest, especially at the elementary level, that you, you can do it yourself or you can invite people from your community to come in who are musicians of various kinds. And every community has people. And they're not probably all that hard to find. I mean, you can, and they're mostly willing to do it. Mostly, not, not 100%, but, and obviously you gotta be careful what you bring in there. But I was influential to me I, in my elementary and junior high. There were people came in, played the guitar, and sang that were from around where I was, and it was uh, had a big impact. And I think that's that's all I can say. I, I wish the schools had more of a specialist, but if you if you yourself know anything about that, or know individuals that could come in, even for a day, I used to go around for years. I went to 20 states doing this, and would come in for three days. We'd get a group of kids, and we write songs, and then we'd perform the songs at the end. And it was, uh, what, uh, if you're, any of you are to teachers here, you'll understand that what teachers told me always, never fail, not one time, and I did this I don't know how many times, scores of times, that uh, there was always a kid who was an outsider, but was really good at making up songs. And it often made a difference in that kid's life after I left because they felt like they had succeeded and the other people saw them succeed. They were good when we would all take suggestions, what, what the next line should be, what some kid, and everybody looked at him like, you know, that kid's a loser. But he wasn't a loser. He was very good at doing that. And why? Because he didn't think like other people. You know, the people you want in those kind of classes, by the way, are not the best students. I'd rather have a class, rather than having a class of the uh, gifted and talented, I'd rather have a class of special ed kids to write songs because their associations are much more interesting. They're not trying to not fail. They always fail. They're not afraid to fail. It's interesting. I have uh, 
two fairly specific answers to that. Number one is, for the very reason that Larry just said, class size. Yeah. If you can get class size down, you'll have a better school. That's true. If you get class size down, you'll have a better classroom. Now that is kind of a political question, actually. That's true, though. That's absolutely true. And if you have a smaller class size, you can get to know which kid might actually find an apple to be inspiring, or which might find songwriting to be songwriting to be inspiring, or might make a they might find a balance sheet to be sure. exciting. You can find that one thing that floats that kid boat. Um, class size. If I teach the music 101 classes there, they're often very large, and there was one semester that the division chair accidentally hired too many people to teach it, so we had like 12 students in it. And that semester, they got higher grades, and they responded better. Sure. Class size. Uh, and the other thing, other specific answer, is community involvement. That uh, is part of what you were saying also, and that goes back to my uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base technicians. Uh, we recently traveled to Orkney, Scotland to look for other mainlands, and we actually found a place where people could spell the word, even though it's a vocabulary word, uh, where everyone was named mainland. <laughs> and Orkney Island had uh, about 200 residents, and they had a school. And the local farmers, that's the local business, is farming, uh, were in the windmill business, generating their own electricity, and they generated enough electricity to sell some to Norway and to mainland Scotland, which is kind of where the name came from. And uh, they, the local farmers had built a windmill that generated enough money to pay the teachers and to uh, bring in uh, community musicians, community scientists, community archaeologists to teach the kids. So you had a kid, and you had a school with maybe 20 students in there that were, were uh, well-funded, and they were well-interfaced with all the resources of that little island community. Uh, I would hold their education up against anything anywhere, because smaller class size, community involvement. Uh, so this is a fun question. Uh, someone in the audience asked, which album have you listened to in your lifetime that you have considered to be near perfect, if not completely perfect? Why? <laughs> oh, yeah, these, these, are, these questions are impossible. You know that. I mean, uh, you, think about it yourself. What are you going to say? There are so many that you have. They're different. I mean, how can you compare an album you know, by the Beatles to an album? by uh, somebody that, that does something else. It, 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 first of all, with me, and this goes back to how we choose Mountain Stage, uh, the, the most important thing in anything is, is the material, is the songs. We're talking about album, we're talking about songs. The songs are the most important thing. So if you're a tech person who's into production, that's a great thing, but if you know, you know what it is, you can't polish. If you don't have anything good to work with, it's not going to be great. But there's some albums uh, like Sgt. Pepper that are great records. There's, it depends on what you like. I mean, the, the band's second album is something that I really like a lot. And I was excited when we got the band on Mountain Stage twice, so that was very interesting to meet and talk to those guys. I had met Levon before, I mean, met uh, Garth before. But those are, those are two. There's, um, Frankly, for me, it's personal taste. For me, um, there are two or three Randy Newman albums that are great. Why? Because the songs are great, that's why. And some things you listen to, and you go back and listen to it, oh, that's a great record. You go back and listen to Peter, Paul, and Mary, mm -hmm. and sometimes you realize uh, the techniques of recording weren't that great always. Mm -hmm. That's not the point. Yeah. It's still a great record because of the material and the performance, particularly the material. I heard uh, a very, very elderly man perform in, in, uh, at a banjo meeting I went to in, in Nashville. A man's name Morgan Sexton. You ever come across him? Who? Morgan Sexton. Oh. Some guy from Asheville. He was pushing 90. Yeah. His voice was terrible. His banjo playing was really, really simple. His banjo was a piece of junk. 
And he got up in front of this large audience of banjo enthusiasts. There were maybe 400 people there. It was a Tennessee Banjo Institute, and kind of esoteric organization. This man had everyone in that audience spellbound. You could hear a pin drop. He didn't sing well, he didn't play well, but he knew how to spin a song. You can't quantify that. Uh, it's magic. It wasn't well produced, it wasn't well done, but it was magic. He knew old songs, they were interesting, but he knew how to spin them. Well, yeah, the, the, best, the best music, particularly the best songs, they, they, they go heart to heart. And that's, that's rough. That's it's, it's a really difficult thing to do, anything, to go, you know, we can all intellectually recognize something, but when you feel something in that communication, my, my opinion is when you go to a really great concert and everybody's there and they're all together, the band is performing, the audience is also performing. So I, I appreciate Pete Seeger and others saying, you know, make your own music, don't, don't go to a performance, make your own. Audience is performing too. There's a, there's a term for it in, in Spanish Celtic. It's called Miadorio. We had a band on Mount Stage called Miadorio from Spain. I said, what does that mean? They said, that's the name of the spirit that goes from the performer to the audience and back. And there's something big deal about that. And it, it, it travels from heart to heart and, and does, you know, and, and it bypasses any technical. You, you can be great without being good. You can be, you know, wonderful, but that doesn't mean, you know, Bob Dylan's a wonderful singer, but he doesn't. Some people say he's got a bad voice, who cares? His songs are great and he puts it across. And that's, that's what you, that guy did. And I've seen that many times, people, because it's real and because it's connecting to you. So all you think is, man, this is wonderful. Yeah. Um, so given that yesterday was Constitution Day, yep. um, and this is our Constitution Day event, how do you believe that the Constitution ties into the arts and higher education? Now, this answer can be as broad or specific as you'd like. So, tough one to think about it. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The uh, framers of the Constitution were very wise in that they left a lot of open-ended questions and didn't, didn't get involved. Uh, and uh, the issue of government funding of the arts is a two-edged sword, you know, to promote things that aren't necessarily commercially popular is a good thing, but what you fund and what you don't can be a dangerous, slippery slope. And so that's a, that's a difficult thing that, that requires a lot of thought, a lot of discussion. Um, public funding for the arts can do a lot of good. Uh, public regulation of the arts could do a lot of harm. Um, anyone interested in that should read uh, Dmitry Shostakovich's uh, memoir. It's called Testimony. And he talks about being a composer in, of the avant-garde during the Stalin era and the outrages that he endured just to simply write music and some of the shortcuts he took and uh, some of the trouble he got into. Um, the only thing I would say about Constitution has to do with the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of expression, that's what the arts is all about, freedom of expression, freedom of, you can say what you want. And um, since I'm here representing Mountain Stage, I've referred to it many times. We have a rule, Mountain Stage is not a political show. There are many people that wish that we were. There are people in the state who are, have different sides of public, political, mostly the ones on the left, who wish we, we took stands about things. We're not gonna do that. And, for many reasons. One is, Mountain Stage is owned by the state of West Virginia. When we do something, that's implying the state of West Virginia is saying this, which is, I'm not gonna, that's an institutional lie. I'm not gonna do that. Uh, however, our rule on the show is simple. And it's, it, this fits history of songs and its freedom of expression. 
And this goes for politics, it goes for religion, it goes for philosophy. You can sing all the hymns you want on mountain stage, but you can't preach a sermon. So if you got something to say, you put it in a song and you can sing it on the show. I don't care what it is. But if you go from there and say, and now to follow up on this, if you'll write in so-and-so and vote for somebody, no. That's gone. So I think freedom of expression is one thing that that's what the arts in many ways all about. And freedom sometimes to be bad. Freedom sometimes to be obviously controversial, to be provocative. Of course, that's what, that's what it's all about. That's, what, that's part of the deal. Freedom to make you uncomfortable. That's, that sometimes is necessary, really necessary. classroom is much like that as well. I never intend for my class to be political or to have a particular viewpoint. But neither do I intend for it to only teach things that are in each student's comfort zones. Uh, hopefully, actually not. Hopefully, there will be some things that will disturb a student that they'll go home and think about. So uh, this is a question from the audience. Um, they say, why go to college if you feel like it's not really helping you find your passion? I think, I, who said it doesn't, you can't find your passion in college? I was an English major. I had four years to read the great literature of the world. I mean, it was the best thing ever. <laughs> what's, what's the problem here? You know, I got to a minor in philosophy and anthropology. I got to, I, I was totally passionate about, I mean, I didn't know this stuff. I came to college not knowing a lot. I didn't grow up in West Virginia. I've been in West Virginia 47 years. I grew up in Dallas, Texas. My parents liked music and stuff, but it stopped with, you know, Broadway musicals and Hank Williams and stuff. I didn't know anything about fine art or anything. So that's why I'm passionate about this. It really made a difference in my life to go to college. I went to a liberal arts college. It really, I mean, my world suddenly, <laughs> that and in between every year I traveled. Europe twice, around America another time. And this was down back in the 60s when traveling around America was very interesting. So those things are very educational too. But that, I think you can, that's, this is one of the best places to find your passion. You're finding out what other people have done and thought, what they, what they think now. And you might stumble across something you know, like the, like the, the apple. I mean, you, can, you stumble across anything. And sometimes it comes from, I, I stumbled across the romantic poets. And I went to Europe and I, I went around looking for the homes of, you know, Wordsworth and Shelley and Keats. And I was a kid, I was a kid from, from Dallas who, you know, didn't, never heard of these names before. So I, it's a great place to find. Yeah, I love it. I mean, heck. I'd like to have four years right now. Do it again. <laughs> uh, as long as uh, tuition is as expensive as it is, uh, people are going to ask that question, though. Uh, it, you can graduate from a small college like this and be in serious debt. And that forces you to ask the question, well, was this worth it? I never had to ask that question. I, I went to the University of California and, and the University of Cincinnati when it was quite affordable. And that journey is much like the journey that Larry described. Uh, it was a candy store, all these great things. I didn't have to ask those questions. I could freely explore. And what's not great about that? I would still be in school if I could. There get to be financial constraints yeah. on it, and I think as a society we should work to, to mitigate that, to make uh, each person capable of exploring their interests, whatever they may be. If, and by the way, this is an argument for um, for what we talked about before, why you should have a liberal arts college is because if you're doing it right, there'll be a bunch of teachers who are inspiring and inspiring the students. Yeah, you may have to borrow some money to get through, but if, it's, if you're doing it right, when you get out, you'll think, man, 
It's wonderful. It was worth it. And that's different. You know, if, if all you want to do is get trained to, to a, for a certain, whatever it is, I mean, whether it's a, an art or a, a craft or a, a profession, and that's your deal, that's, then you can say, well, I, I invested this amount of money, I'm, I'm going to make this amount of money. Uh, if, if you reduce your life to that, sorry for you. That's, I'm not saying you shouldn't try to make money, make a good living, but if your whole life is predicated on how much money can I make, I'm sorry. I'm from a different world. I don't think that way. All right, so uh, it's about time for us to wrap up. We really appreciate you guys for uh, coming. Do you have any closing statements or anything you'd like to say before uh, we dismiss the students? I'll say well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I think there'd be this many people. I, I know it's a chapel, but and I, I knew that when I came in and all the rows in the front were empty. I knew it was a church of some sort. But thanks for coming out and uh, listening to us. And I thanks to Jim for inviting me down here. I don't give talks. I don't do this sort of thing ever. Uh, so it was, it's a privilege. And, it's, uh, you know, I'm a member of the, the Groundhog Society mm -hmm. here, whatever it is. I'm, I'm, I'm part of that. Uh, my, the guy that I founded Mountain Stage with, Andy Ridener, went here for several years. He didn't quite graduate, but he, he went four years, I think. He didn't quite get his diploma. But he loved it here, and it was a big change in his life because he was from D.C. and he came here. And so a new world. And I, I, I appreciate Concord. And all this, I went to a school smaller than this, and liberal arts schools like this. I, I am, I'm sorry nowadays because I have two kids go, go through school. I know what it costs. It's ridiculous. It's idiotic. It's, it's nuts. And it is, you know, sometimes you do have to wonder, is it worth it? It's a good question, but there's certain things you can only learn in institutions like this, and, and I'm, I'm all for it, and I, I, I wish this place well. And I hope that you can continue this kind of education. I know that it's a fight, it's a struggle. People are worried about money everywhere, but uh, I, I wish you well if you're here. I hope you're getting inspired. And I hope that uh, you, you leave here, you know, looking at the world as a good place and a place full of opportunity, a place a full, a, where you can, you can find happiness because happiness, you know, you've learned that happiness is within and without. So that's, that's my wish for you. When I was young, I went to a French high school for a while and I went to a, a French university for one year. And I discovered their system at that time, uh, I can't speak how they do now, but in the 70s, uh, was a living hell of examinations and tracking. Uh, some of my friends discovered in the high school grade I was in, towards the end, which is like a sophomore in high school, that they could no longer go to college, they had to go into a trade because of a grade they got on an exam. and. Uh, that was repressive and, and scary. Uh, if you didn't mature by a certain age, you were done. On the other hand, the American side of my education uh, was one of search and discovery and finding what I love to do and pursuing it. And I'm very grateful for that. And that somewhat unregulated and uh, individualistic um, approach to learning is our greatness, uh, the creativity that can be fostered. Singling out any subject in the subject here is the arts, but singling out any subject as being one that is unproductive or unneeded or not meeting a particular kind of learning outcome is a very dangerous and discriminatory thing, and we need to work to go the other direction. All right, uh, so with that, let's give a hand clap for our uh, panelists today. So Mr. Gross, he came a, a long way to be with us today, so we had a small little gift for him. You wouldn't see it. Um, so we wanted to give you this little token of Concord. So let's give much. our panelists one last round of applause.
This is our seat of the first Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and so with that, um, you all are dismissed. Um, if you need to... Um, yes, sir. Uh, can I have a question? Uh, yeah, we'll be taking questions after. Uh, I actually, there's a question here on... Wait, can I do this then, or how do you do that? We prefer if you give it back. Could you? <laughs> Could you? Could you? It's tough. Could you take it from? <laughs> it's tough being a student. It is. All so. right. So the panelists are going to be sticking around if you have any other questions. <laughs>